Thank you very much. Uh, uh, John really loves taking questions. He, just is, he really loves doing that. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a talk for about uh, 30 minutes or so, yeah. and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. So during the, you know, as the talk is going along, do you know, get these questions going in your, in your mind so that we can have a very free-flowing time afterwards. So over to you, John. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so first of all, a word about that logo. Um, <laughs> Steve actually um, intentionally had the bite out of the apple because he believed that innocence was lost, that we actually did live in a fallen world. And um, he never wanted us to forget that. And uh, Steve was a great thinker on many, many levels. And uh, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly why it looks the way it looks. So um, I am delighted to be here. And um, I am going to walk through a presentation that actually predates my days at Apple. Um, and so I should explain a little bit about that. And, um, but it was uh, created in a way that became identified with me. And so the JB up there, it's John Brandon. It's me. And so if you don't like this presentation, you've got no one to blame but me. And, um, but let me explain why I created this particular talk and why I gave it to the employees of three different companies. So back in the mid-1990s, I worked for a company called Adobe Systems. Many of you know Adobe because of Photoshop or PDF files or Adobe Illustrator, uh, InLine, whatever. If you especially have any friends in the design world, you would know Adobe. And uh, we acquired, while I was at Adobe, we acquired another large company. And the business of those two companies aligned up perfectly, but the cultures did not. And um, so I was asked to move to Seattle from the San Francisco Bay Area, the Silicon Valley, to go lead that new campus, that new group of people. And very quickly I realized that we had a culture misalignment. And so I begin to answer a lot of questions one-on-one, -on -one, especially where the new acquired employees were saying, I don't understand. Why do you do this? What do you all, you know, why do you act this way? Why is this important? And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to give them 10 simple rules for them to understand basically the values that are important to Adobe. And that's the basis of this. Um, a few years later, I left Adobe to go run my own company. I was not the founding CEO there. I was uh, brought in by the venture capitalists, by the financiers. And uh, I realized on, in the early days, in fact, I'm going to tell you one of those stories tonight, that there was also a cultural problem. And, um, and so guess what I brought out? I brought out these 10 rules so that we could begin to have a conversation as a company about how, what did we believe in and why did we believe it? And then um, after I was able to sell that company, I took a break. And it's a long story, which I won't go into, but I got recruited to Apple in the middle of 2001 by Steve and by Tim because they wanted to change the sales culture. And for those of you that remember, Apple had had some challenges then. They had had a big problem with a, a decision that their a senior salesperson had done and it made public news. And they wanted, they wanted things to change. And uh, so they said, John, if you come, you just need to know that's going to be kind of job one. And I said, OK, I know a little bit about this. Guess what? I'll, uh, I'll do that. Now, I didn't ask Steve for permission. I didn't ask Tim for permission. 
I just started to do this presentation. And every time we brought the worldwide sales force together, every year we would go through these. Because we wanted the team to know what we believed and how we wanted them to think and how we wanted them to act to set a value base that a lot of them come out of my personal values, but I knew they lined up with what Steve and Tim wanted in the company. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you those 10 rules. And I'm going to tell you a couple stories. They're all my stories, um, not anybody else's, all stories that I uh, lived through. And then we're going to use this, as Daniel said, as a basis of a discussion. And um, uh, literally, the ground rules of the discussion is you can ask me any question except what the new Apple products are going to be. <laughs> Even though I retired two and a half years ago and I don't, I don't work there anymore, they'll still hunt me down. So I can't tell you that. All right, so welcome to JB's Rules of Success. By the way, that's not what it was originally entitled, but that's what it affectionately became known as. And so if you would talk to Apple employees in all those days, this is, and, and hence the name. All right, rule number one, let go of the old, make the most of the future. Now, this is a particularly important if you're going to spend your career in technology. And why is that? Because technology changes very quickly. And if you're a person that always wants to look backwards and hold on to the known, you're going to be very frustrated if you decide to work in the technology business because things change at a very, very rapid pace. In fact, Steve once said, if Apple was an automobile, we'd have no rear view mirror because I never want to look backwards. In fact, he didn't even like to celebrate anniversaries. He didn't, he just, that's, that's just not how he was wired. He always wanted to look ahead. And so this was a very important principle that we wanted our employees to understand, is that there was going to be change. And some of it was going to be very rapid. Let me give you a perfect example of this. I joined Apple um, June 1st, 2001. This is when the only products they were selling was the Macintosh some software. They had just um, in, in, embraced uh, and opened their first Apple retail stores, and all of Wall Street thought it was the stupidest idea they could possibly imagine. In fact, every other high-tech company that had tried to have their own stores had failed. Not only were we going to do something that everybody else had failed at, but our stores were going to be bigger and more expensive. And Wall Street thought that was really stupid. But Steve knew that he wanted to create a different kind of environment so that our products could be seen in the best possible light. And that was going to be very difficult to do with all of our business partners around the world. And so he knew that although at the time, the company was called Apple Computer, Inc., not Apple Inc. That wasn't going to be true forever. That was June. In October, what did we announce? A little product called the iPod. And we decided, as a computer company, to go try to save the music industry. Now, if you're an employee that loved the old, and thought that everything Apple should be about is only computers, that was a really bad time for you. Because you had to understand completely different things about how the music industry worked and how digital music worked and this little device called an iPod. But that started us on this wonderful journey. So we went from the Mac to the iPod. Remember what was, happened in 2007? something called the iPhone. And of course, today, 
Apple's mostly known around the world as a phone company, not as a computer company. In fact, a few years later, Steve dropped the name computer in the company name. And then after that, what came? The iPad. And when everybody else's tablet had failed up until that point, Apple proved that there was a wonderful market for a tablet if it worked differently. And then after that, the watch. Now, let me just put some things in perspective about how that changed. How many of so Hong Kong, my experience in Hong Kong is people love nice watches, right? Very nice watches. And uh, so for a very high-end brand of a watch, if, how many units do you think they would have to sell in a year to have a good year? About 35,000. You sell, if you have a high-end branded watch, you would sell about 35,000 a year. Apple sells about 35,000 Apple watches in a few hours. See why it was important to let go of the old and embrace the future? Because that's the nature of the kind of company we're. Adobe was that way, the little company I ran, and it was really that way for Apple. And so this very first principle is we wanted a kind of mindset. Now, you should know this mindset applies to every other kind of organization. Organizations change. Higher ed changes, sometimes slower than some people would like, <laughs> but it, um, uh, companies change. So. Let go of the old, make the most of the future. Second one, always tell the truth. We want to hear the bad news sooner than later. There's a lot in that particular principle. First of all, we wanted to be known as truth tellers. And the very best companies in the world tell the truth to themselves, to their employees, and to their customers. And we wanted to be rooted in how life really was, not how we thought life necessarily should be. And we wanted to create an environment that we wanted to hear bad news sooner than later. We didn't shoot the messenger. Do you know that old term about somebody comes with bad news and says, you know, this is, the house is on fire, and instead of saying, wow, thank you so much for telling us that. You shoot the messenger. That wasn't the environment we wanted to create. We wanted to create an environment where not only would we tell the truth, but we wanted to create an environment where people would tell us bad news so that we could help solve the problem. Many times what happens is you can create an environment where nobody wants to hear bad news. Problems show up. Problems show up in every organization, every company, every industry in the world. It happens all the time. And then if employees are afraid to tell you, they'll try to solve it themselves. And guess what normally happens? It gets worse. And you find out if you'd only told us a month ago or three months ago, we could have solved it so much more easily than what's happened today. Let me give you uh, a personal story about this. As I mentioned, I had, I had this wonderful time at Adobe, then I got recruited to run this company. And um, I'm going to spare a bunch of the details, but I need to explain enough for you to understand the dynamics of the situation. I got recruited by, at the time, the world's most famous venture capitalist. And uh, I could name a dozen very large companies that he put the money behind. And you may not know his name, but you would definitely know the companies that he had funded. And he said, John, I'm going to make you a deal. If you um, agree to come be CEO of this company, I need to make a change in leadership, I'll personally go out and I will raise the next round of venture capital. Because the company was running out of money, needed more money. And uh, he said, I'll raise the money, you come in as the CEO, and I really feel like this company's got a great future. 
And for lots of reasons, I decided I wanted to try that. I wanted to be a CEO. It was a great opportunity. And so um, he said, but there's one hitch. <laughs> he said, um, you need to start before we actually close the financing round with the new partners. The way that those companies work, and I'll explain this quickly, is that each time they raise a round of financing, they normally bring in what they call a lead investor, someone who says the company is worth this amount, and I will pay my share based on that valuation. Okay? And they said, so we're going to get new investors, but they're not going to want to close and give the round and give us the money until you start. So I said, fair enough. Worked out all those details. Sure enough, I start. It's really fun. Uh, I really enjoyed getting to be a CEO, and I had a great first day. And at the end of the first day, some of my new management team that I had just inherited in this company said, if you don't know, we're going to have a board meeting in three days, and all the old investors and the new investors are going to come together we're going to give a board presentation, and then we're going to close the round um, three days later. I said, fine. Guys, the first three days, we spent all of the time practicing our presentation. We go to the boardroom of this famous venture capitalist. We've got the old investors. We've got the new investors. My new team that I've inherited goes through all of this presentation, and it goes perfectly, perfectly. And in fact, it went so well that the lead venture capitalist, the famous guy who had recruited me, had really nice champagne brought in to toast the new CEO. And of course, I'm the new CEO, so I'm thinking, this is awesome. And, um, and we had this great celebration. Done, done at noon, I go back to the office. And for a reason that I can't even explain, I sent out an email to my management team and said, hey, by the end of the day, let's meet in the conference room. I just want to talk to you one more time. To be honest with you, I kind of wanted to bask in the glory of that morning, right? It had gone so well. I show up. I walk into a room filled full of my management team that had done such a good job this morning, and I realized that the entire mood had changed. They weren't so happy and excited. And I looked at him and said, uh, OK, what's up? And one of them said, did you read Karen's email? I said, uh, no. In fact, I don't even know who Karen is. <laughs> I mean, it was only day three. And they said, well, Karen's the corporate controller. And she's been out on maternity leave. And you should read this email. And I read the email. And I realized that the corporate controller, head of our finances, wouldn't sign off on the numbers we had just presented to all the new investors. In fact, she said, they're flawed. I won't sign off on them. And I looked at the people who had put together the presentation based on those numbers. And I said, uh-oh, what does this mean? And immediately, I began to hear the excuses. Oh, John, John, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Um, yeah, they may be a little aggressive. Anytime you hear about financials being a little aggressive, you should take a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they said, and don't worry, that the new investors like you so much that, yeah, we may not hit those numbers, but you'll have a honeymoon period. And then at the end of the year, you can say, well, we didn't hit those numbers, but here's the new numbers, and everything will be fine. Well, I had been given this talk about tell the truth, we want to hear bad news sooner than later. And I thought, well, guess what? This has got to apply to me. So I looked at him and I said, guys, we're not going to do that. We're not going to take anybody's, number, uh, anybody's money based on numbers that we think are flawed. We're just not going to do that. And one of the co-founders who was on the management team got up quite angry and said, John, you don't get it. If you don't close this round in three days, you, pointing right at me, are going to lay off everybody in the company. And everybody loses their job. And I said, well, actually, I do get it. 
and you don't get it, that I'm not gonna take anybody's money based on flawed numbers. And I'll explain something later to you called securities fraud, and we're not gonna be part of it. And they said, well, what are you gonna do? And I said, well, right now I'm gonna go home because I have a headache. And, uh, <laughs> which I did, it had nothing to do with the champagne at lunch. Um, guys, I drove home. I stumbled into my house, I saw my wife, I told her the story. She's very sweet. We're the kind of couple that when everybody meets my wife, they like us. And um, <laughs> she said, uh, well, John, maybe Adobe will take you back. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. Um, and so, I didn't sleep much that night. The next morning, got to remember, this is day four as being a brand new CEO. I called the new, I mean, the venture capitalist who had recruited me, who had personally vouched and raised this money. And guys, he was super angry, really angry. And he said, John, I'm, I'm, I'm so angry, but he said, you need to call the president of the lead investor. He's the one who set the pricing of this deal. You need to call him now. He was in New York. We were in California. I knew his day had already started. I found him. If the first guy was angry, this second guy was really, really angry. Flames were coming out of the telephone. And he just said, uh, I don't know if we're going to do this. I'm just, I feel misled. I feel lied to. Slams down the phone. And I start calling all the other investors. Finally, I get to the last investor. It was a horrible morning, to be honest with you. And I get to the last investor, and it's this wonderful, uh, great venture capitalist, a female. She's one of them who put the early money into Tesla. She continues to be in that business today and does very well. And um, she picks up the phone and she said, uh, John, good to hear from you. How are you doing? I said, I'm actually not doing very well. And she said, oh, you're calling about the numbers, aren't you? I said, uh, I am. Who already called you? She said, nobody. I said, then how do you know I'm calling about the numbers? She said, they're squishy, aren't they? I said, well, that's a word for it. She said, I know, John. We did our due diligence. We knew that the numbers were way too aggressive. We just wanted to find out how long it was going to take you to figure that out and how long it was going to take you to tell us. I learned a lot about being a CEO that day. Guys, for, in ways I cannot explain, we were, the lead investor still decided to close the round. He still decided to, to close at the original valuation. But I'll never forget, he said, John, I'm going to do this thing. But I'm not going to do it based on those numbers, and I'm not going to do it on your existing management team. In fact, I think you need to trade out a bunch of those people. I'm going to do it because I trust in you. You will tell me the truth. Those are the kind of people I want to invest in. So I know a little bit about this one. And when we got to Apple, there was some truth-telling problems in the sales force. And we needed to completely change the culture about how we were going to tell the truth and how we were going to deal with bad news. Number three, the highest level of ethics is expected. When in doubt, ask. Now, it's funny when I talk about this particular one, lots of people say, well, yeah, that might work in America or the UK, but you don't know about my country or this country or that country. And um, I said, no, you just need to know we want it to work in all the countries. And Apple does business in lots and lots and lots and lots of countries, and all those guys reported into me. And I said, no, we're going to raise the bar, and this is what we're going to expect. The highest level of ethics is expected. But the second sentence is really an important one. 
When in doubt, ask. I actually found that many times employees knew there was a problem, but didn't know what to do. And we wanted to create an environment, a corporate culture, that if there was a question about what was the right thing, what was the ethical thing to do, they would feel free to ask. And I am so glad they did. Because especially in, typically when you go to a new developing country, a lot of times you have business partners there. And a lot of times the business partners decide, hey, listen, we want to do business this way. But it may not be the way you should do business or you want to do business. And so you need to be able to create an environment where your people can say, I don't know what to do. My business partner wants to do this. Do we do business that way or we do it a different way? And this turned out to be a wonderful thing. You can't believe some of the things that people called and asked me about. But what it did is it protected us in so many ways. Because then we could have a conversation. And it can be a teaching moment. You can say, no, we're not going to do it this way for, for X, Y, Z. We're going to go do it this way. And um, again, people told me, this wouldn't work. This isn't going to work in all the countries. Trust me. It works. Now, it does mean that you might have to walk away from some business opportunities. In fact, there were some countries, particularly in some uh, government or educational bidding processes, where I wouldn't even allow my team to bid on them because it was so well known around the country that that business was dirty. So I just say, we're not in that business. And sometimes I remember one time when Tim goes, why aren't we in that business? I said, because it's so dirty, I don't want my guys close to it. He goes, fair enough. Fair enough. So, highest level of ethics is expected. When in doubt, ask. Next one. Now, you remember, this was created primarily for my sales team in Apple. This, but you could, so learn to be a good business person, not just a great salesperson. But you could replace sales with operations or finance or marketing or whatever. This is, I, this is that we wanted to teach people how to look out for the common good and best interests of the company, not just their own group. This is a big problem in a lot of corporate cultures. It's actually a big problem in many organizations where people get myopic and they get tunnel vision and what they want to do is they want to do what's best for they themselves, or their group, or their division, and they forget about the greater, the greater good of the company. For salespeople, a lot of times, they could quickly tell me why this was a great deal for them. <laughs> and the commission that would come their way, the money they would make on it. But a lot of times when you looked at it, you say, but that's not in the best interest of Apple. And so we wanted to change the mentality so that, in fact, I would tell people, you're managing the company's money. Spend it more wisely than you spend your own, which is really important when you're managing salespeople. Because a lot of really good salespeople, they don't manage their money well at all. <laughs> And, um, and so I'd say, no, this is somebody else's money. This is the company's money. So we want you to be a really good business person, not just a great salesperson. Next one. This one is called, everybody sweeps the floor. This was sto blatantly stolen from Adobe, Adobe's culture. So you should know that Adobe Systems has a wonderful culture founded by two famous computer scientists that are still alive today. They're still co-chairman of Adobe. It's still a wonderful company. And this comes directly from Adobe's culture. Do you know what we mean by this? Everyone sweeps the floor. It means that if there's a job to be done, whether you're the CEO or the first in, or the last one in the door as a student intern, no matter what the job is, you help do it. And um, what it does is it breaks down a lot of hierarchy when you see, for instance, 
you go into a room and there's senior execs there and you have to set up chairs. Guess what? The senior execs don't just stand in the corner and talk. Why the poor, you know, brand new intern is the one who's getting the chairs. No, everybody goes, gets the chairs, and they line up. This was a very, there's an infamous funny story about this at, at Adobe. So we had an executive briefing center, and we brought in the CEO of a very large company. You guys would all know the company. And he's one of these CEOs that traveled with an entourage. So like he showed up with like 18 people, you know? And uh, he, they sit in the room, and then uh, my, my team is hosting the customer, and uh, I come in, and then the first part of it, we were going to have the CEO and co-founder of Adobe, Dr. John Warnock, do the first part of the presentation. Well, as luck would have it, the video projector doesn't work. And so, of course, the poor AV people are panicked. But Dr. Warnock, you know how people say people act like they're the smartest guy in the room? He really is the smartest guy in the room. And he immediately looked at it and said, oh, don't worry about it. And he's in his suit, and he goes underneath the table, and he realizes it's a cabling problem. So my CEO is in his suit, on his knees, underneath the table, fixing the cabling. The other CEO, who doesn't act this way at all, thinks, oh no, Dr. Warnock's had a heart attack. Otherwise, there's no reason that he would be underneath the table. <laughs> and pretty soon, two minutes later, Cabling got fixed. Dr. Warner got, gets up, brushes off himself, says, all right, let's start the meeting. And the other CEO is just going. <laughs> I'm not sure the other CEO had even opened a door in the last three years, let alone. But John, that was the culture he wanted, is, wait, if there's a problem, who's the best one to solve the problem? Well, me. I'll do it. By the way, this, is, this creates a great environment. Um, and at Apple, particularly, what we would do is we would be create this environment where everybody would pitch in. And so you didn't worry about how hard you had to work, because other people were going to work just as hard. And no matter what the task was, it would get done. So everybody sweeps the floor. Next one. Be professional in your style, your speech, and your follow through. I particularly wanted this in my sales teams because I thought there was a level of professionalism and civility that was starting to disappear. I really felt like um, it was too easy for the way that we, I just thought we got too casual, to be honest with you, with some of our customers. Now, you should know that Apple is a very casual company in terms of the way they dress, right? But they were very serious and professional in the way they acted. In fact, there was, most of my employees would laugh that I'm up here in a dark suit and a tie. They wouldn't recognize me. In fact, we had an old saying that at Apple, if you were wearing socks, you were dressed up. And, um, <laughs> but, so this isn't, that's not what I mean in terms of style that way. What I meant is that there should be a level of professionalism. You would under-promise and over-deliver, especially on your follow-through. I would tell my sales teams, if you tell a customer you're going to get back to them with a bit of information, give them an accurate date. Don't say, I will call you tomorrow when you know it's going to be the following Monday. Does that ever happen to you? happens to me all the time. It drives me crazy. Um, I flew out here on a famous airline and uh, two days ago, and we were supposed to leave San Francisco at 1.30 in the afternoon. We ended up leaving nine hours later, and the story kept changing. And I thought, you should have just said, no, we got a big problem. You're going to probably wait three or four hours. In fairness, they didn't. They didn't know about the second problem, only the first problem. But I thought, 
Just set the expectations. Be professional. Then everybody say, okay, I get it. Nobody wants to fly in an unsafe airplane. At least I sure don't. But don't tell me it's only going to be an hour if it's going to be four. Don't tell me you're going to call me tomorrow if you're not going to call me until Monday. So forth. Understand what that's about. Next one. Listen to the customer. They almost always get it. So, especially for the students in the room, let me tell you a little secret. The smartest people I know are also the best listeners, not the ones who talk the most. In fact, some of the dumbest people I know are the ones who talk the most. The smartest people are the ones who listen. And in, when you get into a business, it's very important that you listen to your customer because they almost do always get it. Now, they, what they get is they get the problem. They don't always get the solution. So do you know who Henry Ford is? Creator of Ford Motor Company. And he was famous for saying, why would anybody talk to customers? If I had talked to customers about what they wanted, they would just tell me a faster horse, right? when he knew the answer was an automobile. Steve loved that quote, by the way. He loved that quote. But what he and Tim wanted is they wanted Apple employees to be aggressive listeners so that you would ask enough questions to get as much information from the customer. Now, the customer might say, and you have to solve it this way. He didn't have to listen to it that. You just wanted to understand the problem at a deep level. Let me give you a perfect example of that. Apple never really wanted to get in the phone business. Did you know that? Because the phone, particularly the cell phone business, in order to succeed there, you've got to have, you're very dependent on the carriers, <laughs> right? The cell networks. And we, anytime we ever felt like we were in a business where so much was dependent on a partner, we felt like we couldn't succeed because we didn't control our own destiny. However, we would hear from customers all the time about their frustrations with their phone. Even people that bought the most popular phones. They didn't really like them. So in 2007, when we got into the phone business, who was the biggest phone company in, when it came to cell phones? Nokia, by far. We never even talked about competing with them in those days. They were just too big. Okay? Who was the best name in corporate phones? Blackberry. Nokia and Blackberry. But when you would talk to all of our customers, nobody liked either of them. In fact, a lot of BlackBerry users loved it for one thing. What was that? Secure email. Remember, everybody did this. Doo -doo -doo -doo. And, and, but they weren't very good phones. In fact, some of our corporate customers would carry a second phone to make phone calls, BlackBerry to do emails. Crazy, two phones in your pocket, right? And more and more, we begin to listen to what customers wanted to do. Steve also realized that they wanted to do a lot more than secure email, make a phone call, and send texts. What did they really want? They wanted a computer in their pocket. They wanted to access the web. They wanted to actually do real work on their phone. How'd that turn out for Apple? Really, really well. And that's why, by the way, we, we really believe that BlackBerry didn't understand that as soon. They really felt like the thing that would never, people would never change is the physical keys. So they laughed at us when there were no physical keys on the iPhone. Nokia didn't, they were wonderful phones, but you couldn't do other things very well. The customer knew, though, and they told us they just couldn't imagine what we would do. And so great companies 
listen to the customer, they get the problem, and then the really great ones are creative in the way they solve it. Okay? Next one. Oops, let's go back. Next one. Uh, create win-win relationships. This is an important one. To, be, to run a very large business like you do in Apple, you cannot do all the business yourself direct. You can't. You need business partners. And you need lots of good suppliers. And you need lots of resellers. And the idea with this one is we wanted to create relationships where it was not only good for Apple, but it was good for them. In fact, many times my sales people would come to me and say, OK, John, I want to do this deal. And they would always explain what was gr why it was great for Apple. It was very important. But then I would, at the end of the presentation, say, yeah, but you left a very important part out. Explain to me why it's good for the partner. Why does it work for them? And, um, and now, this doesn't mean you can't be a tough negotiator. Apple's reputation in the industry are we were the toughest negotiators. And sometimes, we would ask for things that the other person would think was unreasonable. And one time I would say, if you think that's unreasonable, then you just need to say no, because we want it to work for you, but that's the way we'd like to have it work. And, but the best business relationships is a win relationship for not only you, but your partner. Next one. Ah, look out for each other. Sharing information is a good thing. You know the old saying, information is power? That is a problem in many, many, many organizations where people feel like withholding information makes them more valuable. And therefore, they will do better than everyone else because they've got some of the secrets. We hated that mentality. What we wanted is a place where if you learn the answer to something, we wanted to celebrate it when you shared it with everybody so they didn't make the same mistake, right? So if, if my sales team in China figured out a very clever way how to sell a position a certain product, we wanted them to tell the French guys, we wanted to tell the folks in Brazil, we wanted to tell the folks in America, we wanted to take best practices and share it. And we wanted them to celebrate that everybody on the team was going to win. This is a, this is, this, by the way, if you're in an organization where people look out for each other and, and they share information that's going to make everybody better, that's the sign. That's one of the first signs of a healthy organization. If you're in an organization or a company where people withhold information, say, well, let them figure that themselves, right? We wasted a lot of time doing that. They should waste time, too. You're going, what? Um, so look out for each other. Sharing information is a good thing. Ah, the last one. Don't take yourself too seriously. It's amazing how people can show up in organizations and act like it's all about them. Uh, now, we had an old saying at Apple is if you think you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> OK? And um, this was about attitude. Every, and by the way, there's a lot of things you can't control. To be honest with you, you can't really control a lot of the talents or intelligence or other things that you've been given. But you know what you can always control? You can always control your attitude. And um, one of those things is don't take yourself too seriously. I have never once been on a team when people would say, we really want to work for that person or work with that person because they're a pompous so-and-so. And wouldn't it be fun to have them on the team? Or we want to be with them because they always think about themselves first. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to do that. And so what we want to do is create an environment that say, hey, listen, don't take yourself too seriously. And if you take yourself too seriously, we won't. <laughs> if you can't laugh at yourself, we'll end up laughing at you. 
That's what would happen. And it just creates a completely different kind of environment. So particularly if I'm one of the students here tonight and you're headed off to your internships, remember that. If you're smart, they'll figure it out. You don't have to tell everybody how smart you are, right? And um, look out for the best interests of your team, not just your own best interests. People will figure it out, and they'll appreciate it. Ten simple rules. There's no brilliance in any of that. But there's wonderful, wonderful practice and empowerment if done well. And so you can see uh, we, we brought it in. We changed the culture. And if you haven't heard, Apple did pretty well. <laughs> Daniel. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, earlier today at the leadership workshop, we were talking about how leaders cannot please everyone. So you managing a large group of people, so many departments, you must have encountered a lot of challenges. So I want to hear your experience of how you overcame such challenges. Um, but that's a great question. And that's absolutely right. As a leader, you can't please everyone. And that should never be a goal of yours. Should never be a goal of yours. In fact, if you're a leader and you think that's one of your important goals, you should rethink your goals. Um, so the way that we did it is we decided, again, I'll use the Apple example, is that there was a certain way we wanted to act and think, you saw that, no matter what culture and no matter what, what company uh, that we dealt with in terms of customers. And Sometimes people won't get it, and that's okay. Uh, we would always say, we're going to explain ourselves, we're going to explain it well. If you're an employee, you either agree with us, and then you get to stay, <laughs> or if you don't agree, don't stay. That's all right. And for our customers, we'd say, no, we're only going to do business this way, and if that doesn't work out for you, then that's OK. You can go do business with somebody else. And at first, people thought we were really arrogant about that. And we weren't trying to be arrogant. We were trying to not waste people's time. And we were trying to set expectations that um, we could actually fulfill. And so, but it does mean as a leader that sometimes you'll have people disagree with you. In fact, almost always you're going to have people disagree with you. And you're going to have some people that are going to um, always want some kind of special deal. But the best leaders set, in fact, there's a great definition of a great leader. And that is the one who defines reality. The best leaders are the ones that are rooted in truth. And then let all their teams, the people that are following him, to know this is the way it really is. And and so, uh, yes, you're going to have to disappoint some people. That's OK. That's really OK. Hello. It was my pleasure to, to see you tonight. Um, I am the uh, channel manager from China Telecom Global Company. My name is Whitney. And I have been responsible for um, cooperating with Apple for over six years. Wonderful. Um, so, yeah, in mainland China. Uh -huh. I just come to Hong Kong for no more than two months. Um, I'm coming to Hong Kong because last year, in June, um, the relationship with China Telecom, actually, uh, the relationship with all the Chinese carriers with Apple flagship stores in China um, had, um, had drew back. I didn't know the reasons why, and just now you said, um, it is important to share information. I wonder, is this sharing only internally in Apple, or can you share the reasons why? Ah, OK. Uh, great, great question. All right. Thanks. I was talking about sharing internally. In fact, if you work for Apple and you share some corporate secrets with people outside the company, you won't be at Apple very long. <laughs> But 
you must work into Brian Liu's organization. Do you work into Brian Liu's? So I hired Brian. He's a dear friend. In fact, I was hoping that he was going to get to come tonight. And Brian knows these rules by heart. And you should call Brian and say, okay, Brian, I want, I want your help about what I can tell those partners and what I can't. So sharing information about that was helping your teammates and your fellow employees. It was not about sharing things sometimes with customers because it's just inappropriate. And again, remember, Apple as an innovator, we were always changing things. And many of our competitors viewed themselves as fast followers. They never innovated, they just copied us. Can you think of any one company that competes with Apple that's kind of known to do that? Yeah, anyway, <laughs> think about it. And so we were very, very diligent about what we shared outside the company because we knew people wanted those secrets and they wanted some of the ways to compete with us. So very different. Just send a note to Brian Liu, Brian, uh, and tell him that JB said, <laughs> I'm supposed to ask you this question. He'll love it. Be good. Good for him. All right. Yes. Yeah, I've got the microphone. Um, yes, my question is totally different. Um, apart from alluding to the Garden of Eden at the very beginning of the talk, you haven't really said anything about how any of these are informed by either your faith, well, I assume they're your faith, these ones, but, um, or Steve Jobs' faith or anyone else's faith at the top of the organization. So could you say something about that? Yeah, absolutely. So let's start with uh, a basic principle is no one should ever talk about another person's faith. <laughs> They'll let them speak about their own faith, even though I had conversations with both Steve and lots of conversations with Tim about faith. Both are, um, Steve when he was alive and Tim today, very deep, deep thinkers. And, um, and so, but what you see up there, or what you saw up there, is rooted in my own personal faith. And so, no, I don't want anybody to have to guess, I'm actually a follower of Jesus. I think he's the greatest teacher of all time. I actually truly believe he was divine. And, um, and so there in virtually behind all of those principles are actually, more importantly, principles taught in the Bible. And which, of course, is the guidepost for those who, who believe in following Jesus. And so, by the way, Steve knew I felt that way. Tim knows I feel that way. We, and we never apologized for that um, and, uh, and shouldn't. In fact, one of the things they really came to appreciate is about how serious my faith was and how it was going to impact the way that I worked and the way I treated people and the way that I would conduct business. And... Um, um, and so, at a different time, maybe, we can talk more about that. But, yeah, that's, those ten rules are deeply rooted in my personal faith, which is a Christian faith. And, um, uh, yeah, so there you have it. Yeah. Do you think Apple also, uh, you know, has a reflection of those kind of value, faith values at any point in its yeah, yeah. stores or in its products? Yeah, and so uh, I can, because this is public news if you don't know, so the original creator of Apple Retail is a wonderful man of faith. He's a friend of mine. He won't have any problem with me talking about his faith. His name's Ron Johnson. He created all the Apple Retail stores. Guys, those stores are a reflection of, of his own personal theology. Um, and it's rooted in a biblical worldview of particularly how you are to treat individuals and that every individual is, uh, should be treated as an individual and should be respected and trusted. And um, we at Apple had a deep corporate culture. We loved beauty. 
If you look at our industrial design, it's amazing. It's as good as any product line in the world. Where does the concept of beauty come from? We actually believe it it's, uh, comes from a creator. And uh, now, not everybody believed in the God of the Bible, but they did at Apple believe in this deep sense that details mattered, great design matter, beauty mattered. You can open up an Apple computer and the insides of it, the design is better looking than some of our competitors outside. <laughs> Go home, do this, find your old laptop, take it apart, look at the inside, and it's going to be prettier than some of our competitors. And the, so this was a corporate culture is we love great design, we loved beauty. That would be rooted in that. And, um, and I could go on and on about that. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Amy. And I have a question about one of your rules of everybody sweeping the floor. Well, it uh, kind of give me a feeling that the, mo the people who are most capable usually you know, may do more things than others. So would it be a concern that some of the employees might not be motivated enough to you know, finish their work because they know that there will be somebody else to help them to get through? And so how are you going to weigh this role against you know, a division of labor and responsibility? Okay. Thank you. That's, that's a great question. So first of all, just because you can sweep the floor um, doesn't mean that some of those tasks should be your main tasks. Just that, that's not the point here. Like, for instance, you do not want me running an engineering team. You just don't. That's not, I'm not a world-class engineer. So, I, so that's, first of all, is we were very clear about people have, trying to play to their strengths. However, if you have an environment where people don't want to work as hard because somebody else will take care of them, those are the employees that we got rid of. You just need to know. We just got rid of those. We, that was not a problem on any of my teams because we wanted everyone to work hard. In fact, the idea of everyone sweeping the floor is if everybody pitched in, it saved time for everyone. Okay? But it didn't mean that I should be worried about engineering when that wasn't my, that, that wasn't the idea. And it didn't mean that I didn't have to work hard because I knew Daniel would do it if I didn't do it. Yeah. So just to be very honest with you, if we saw that kind of behavior in employees, we encourage the employees to go do something else at a different company. Yeah. OK, I did pay attention. And um, what, if, what about in the case that you cannot tell people to go away? So for rule number one, you said let go of the past and embrace the future. But let's say if a good leader is working with a group of people that are reluctant to change, and you, they know you, can, you cannot fire them. So in that case, what can you do? Or what would a best a good leader? Well, so that's a great question, first of all. And I never put myself in places where I couldn't change the talent. Um, but I'm aware there are lots of, lots of uh, corporate environments, sometimes educational environments, where it's very hard to change out personnel. The, the, a great leader, though, keeps, doesn't default to the lowest common denominator doesn't default to the bad attitude, doesn't default to we can't do it this way because we've always done it that way. They keep creating the vision, and, they, and even if they have to do some things to, to just prove to people that this new way is actually better. And that can be hard. I'm not saying this was easy. In fact, uh, you know, Apple, we had another great saying is, Never confuse a clear vision with a short distance. Okay, so sometimes it takes a long time. Uh, I I'm aware of a situation, actually in the U.S. in because of some ways that some labor unions worked, where to be honest with you, to make change, they just needed some of the longest standing employees to retire. <laughs> There was no other way to solve the problem. So I'm not telling you it's going to be easy. I'm not telling you it's going to be short. But, but 
you still should be able to uh, create that expectation. And thank you, because I know that I'm on the right track now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Venus. Thank you so much for coming and sharing tonight. Um, so you share a lot of good points just now. Um, for example, like everyone sweeps us the floor and like sharing information. But I'm wondering if you can share a bit more um, about how, like what are the measures that you have taken to change the culture, especially when you're new to the company, uh, aside from setting a good example? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so to be very clear, uh, a great leader needs to do a couple things. First of all, create the new set of expectations. A great leader is consistent in those expectations. A great leader is someone who rewards people when they do the right thing. You always want to catch people doing the right thing and saying, that's exactly what we want different. Sometimes, though, you can't do it by yourself. So to be very clear at Apple, the organization was so large, I realized that I needed to bring in some new leadership with me. And so I went off and found some ex-leaders who had worked for me at previous companies who bought into this and then came in. And that created some tension, to be honest with you. But I knew where we were going, and I knew the way we had to get there, and I couldn't get it without some help. Now, the fun thing about bringing in people who believe like you, then they can model it the same way you model it when you're not there. And so, so that's what I would do, is you want to create the expectation, you want to be consistent in that expectation, you want to reward people for doing the right thing, but also sometimes you might need help and need to bring others in to help you get it done. Okay? Um, hi, my name is Sally. Thank you for your talk. Um, at the start of the talk, you'd mentioned that um, you guys had to take a risk in um, moving on from the computer business to iPods and iPhones. And um, during our earlier discussion in our forum, we talked about risk taking and taking responsibility. And I wanted to just ask, um, you have any advice for um, the, the decision making process or the risk taking process? Yeah, boy, that's a great one, and we could talk all night about that. But um, let me, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some of Apple's culture that doesn't show up here. So Steve believed that Apple should only do a few things, but do those few things better than anybody else. And that sounds really easy, but that's particularly hard when you've created a company filled full of brilliant engineers that can build anything. Literally, at Apple, they can build anything. You name the product, and they can build it. They've got the best engineers in the world. They own their own software engineers, their hardware engineers, great designers. They build their own silicon. Oh my gosh. But Steve would say, just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Remember your mother would tell you that? <laughs> just because you can doesn't mean you should. And so. He was brilliant at saying, we're only going to do a few things. And so they needed to be really important things. And in the decision, we, we would have this conversation about, can we uniquely add value to that thing? And do we have competitive advantages? And if the answer was no, we'd never get in the business. Tim Cook runs the company the same way. Tim has a little different problem than Steve had in the early days. Tim is running the world's most valuable company, and it's extremely large. So think about his challenge now. Anytime he invests money in engineers, it needs to be a really big idea. And literally, it needs to be a product line that generates $10 billion in annual revenue in US dollars, or it's not worth it. That's like creating a Fortune 500 company with every product line. That's hard. And so then there's always that risk reward. Just happens to be he's brilliant at it. Steve was brilliant at it. Um, but uh, the other thing that they've done really well is they only do a few things. One of the, Tim is famous for um, saying, the beauty about Apple is I could take a standard size table and lay out all of our products on it. And he's right. 
There's some simplicity there that is just wonderful. Hard to do, but wonderful. Yeah, great question. Thank you, John, for your talk. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit more about you. I mean, um, given that the rules of uh, your success and um, you follow them, obviously, but Apple's a very competitive and, and talented people within the company. So I just want to know, how did you differentiate yourselves from everybody else? Why did Tim and Steve put so much trust in you as an employee? What made you stand out uh, from everybody else that you're able well, to run a $100 I, billion dollar business and, you know, just given the, the talent pool in, in Apple? Isn't Again. that obvious? Look, I'll... <laughs> um, um, let me, uh, boy, that's, that's, that's a loaded question. Um, let me, just a couple things. Um, one of, and this is some advice that I gave last night to the students, or, or yesterday morning, I guess, to the students, is I really think all of us need to learn to be very objective, ruthlessly objective with ourselves about what we're good at and what we're not. And then we should play to our strengths. And so I learned literally in the first 90 days when I joined Apple, I'd never be CEO there. It's an engineering, product-driven company, and I'm neither. And so I needed to come to that reality, uh, especially because I'd been a CEO right before that. Um, I also um, realized, though, that I had some skills that the company desperately needed. And I had a style that the company desperately needed. I think I told this story earlier. When I got to Apple, I found out that there was a really bad reputation of many of the senior execs about the way they treated receptionists and executive assistants. And um, so one of the things I decided early on is I was going to learn their names, I was going to say thank you, and I was going to be kind to them. And I didn't realize how impactful that was till a bunch of months later when I talked to one of the gals and she said, you should know the first six months I didn't know your name, so I always called you as you were the vice president who was nice to us. <laughs> But I really felt like that's a way that I could help the common good. I could really help the corporate culture. Now, guys, make no mistake about it. Apple's a very tough culture. It is not for everybody. I have an oldest, I have three children. My oldest daughter works there, and I never wanted any of my children to work there, actually. Um, not because I, I don't love the place and not that I don't have the deepest respect for Tim, because that's really true. I just wasn't sure I wanted him to go through what I went through, the long hours and the pressure and all of that. But this is also one of those things. And by the way, this is the benefit of being a follower of Jesus. So the Christians have this idea. It's a very important idea about personal call. So we believe, again, I'll give you a little theology here. We believe that in Christians, there's two calls in our life. The first call is Jesus calls us to himself, into relationship. That's the heart of the gospel, okay? The second is that God loves us enough that he can call us into places and things. And he wants us to be in, in those kind of environments where he, he personally calls us. The scriptures are filled full of those stories. I believe those are all true, and they're true today. And so it was also a sense of calling. And, um, you know, I spent 14 and a half wonderful years there, but it all, I was also clear when the season was over. In fact, Tim doesn't like this when I say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. I believe that every Apple employee has an expiration date, much like a carton of milk. And the secret was to know that before the company figured it out. <laughs> and then leave on your own terms. And so that was the other thing, is I really felt like I was called there for a season. It was an amazing season. I feel like the most blessed person in the world. But I also knew when it was time to go, I needed to go.
Yeah, hope that's helpful. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, I think that the uh, rules concern about values and uh, belief more than it's just just a rules. Okay, I would let you know. You know, innovators, uh, designers, engineers are smart people. They have their own values before joining the apples. Could you give me uh, some example how to bring these smart people to work for together for the common good rather than for their own self? Yeah. Well, this this is this is where leadership takes place. Um, you have. You know, we needed to recruit talent from all over the world, and you would have engineers that came in. Like, here's a perfect example. In the technology business, there are two very opposing ideas about what technology you own and what you license, for instance. And there's also an opposing um, marketing idea, like, for instance, that you, the only way to win is to have the lowest price product. Apple has a very distinct opinion about that. We decided that everything that's essential to our products, we would control. And we would not share with other people. We don't license our operating system. We're not Android. We're not Windows. And so sometimes people, the engineers would come in and say, no, 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 I came from the Android world or the Windows world. This would be so much smarter. And we'd say, ah, nope. If that's how you want to think about building products, good luck. Just not here. Um, same thing with the way that we go to market. When we decided to bring Apple retail stores to China, Everybody told us we were going to fail. I don't want to offend anybody here, but I'm going to tell you exactly what they told us. Number one, Chinese consumers would never pay list price for anything. They would haggle for price on every product. Number two, they would not ever buy software. They would never buy content or media. They would borrow it. <laughs> Number three, they wouldn't really care about the world-class brand. They'd be happy to buy counterfeit. Number four, they would have no appreciation for big, nice stores. That's not how they shopped. Guess what? All those pundits, they were 100% wrong. After the US, Greater China is Apple's single largest market. That Apple cons uh, that Chinese consumer loves Apple products. They loved the idea that when they came in, it was, they knew that it was really going to work. And if they had a problem, we'd stand behind it. They loved that it was actually um, well made. They loved that they could come and not be hurried in and out of the stores. That they could ask questions. That they could spend some time before they left. All those things. and. But we literally had people tell us, you'll never be a success in Apple unless you change your ways. By the way, they told me the same thing when we went to India. They said, if you don't have a cheap phone, if you don't have it, and like that, you'll never sell anything in India. They were also wrong about that. You just have to set the expectation. And either people agree. If they agree, then they're happy to stay on the team. If they don't agree, we really wish them well. There's a lot of places they can go work, just not here. Yeah. Can I have the final question? Please. Yeah. So, because we're running out of time, but I, I'm curious about how your faith operated in uh, Apple, and, and maybe you could tell us the moment where actually your faith was so important in the decisions you made, that, but it made a huge difference, that, or the toughest kind of uh, moment in Apple where your faith really had to hold you together. Oh, boy. Um, so I have a bunch of those moments. Um, so let me, um, I, I'm going to tell you a story that is a public story, but this was a, this was a really hard one. So guys, um, when I joined Apple in 2001, Apple did very little business in mainland China. And um, we always knew it was going to be a big market. And we knew that we needed to go in there and figure out the business before we brought Apple Retail there. 
And so I hired a brilliant exec to um, move to Beijing. And up, up until that time, we ran all of Greater China out of Hong Kong. But we felt for some political reasons we needed to be in Beijing. And, um, and empowered him to hire a team. And he uh, did hire a team, and he started to do very well. And then I'll spare you the details, but it, uh, we, were starting to get tr we, we were starting to get traction. We were starting to grow the business. And then it was brought to my attention that we had an ethical problem. And it turned out to be a very big ethical problem. But it was so ingrained in the team, they had even made a Mandarin word for it. That's a not good when culturally they've decided that this is so important that they've, they've given it its own name. And so guys, again, I'll spare you the details, but I needed to go in there and I needed to fire the vice president and I needed to fire 80% of the organization. And I needed to tell Tim and Steve that this great success we were having, some of it was not real. And really hard. I really liked particularly the leader. I personally hired him. I liked the team. Guys, um, if you know anything about the Chinese press, they particularly in those days were very excited when an American company made mistakes. So we made the national news. One day there were 55 news websites in, in China, and the only two words that weren't translated into Mandarin, John Brandon. <laughs> um, uh, the next time after that happened, the next time I went back, um, I needed to travel with a bodyguard. Concerns about personal safety, that sometimes happens when you make tough choices. Um, now, why do I share that one? Uh, because it was really inconvenient. <laughs> it was really inconvenient, doggone it. Uh, one of the things I had promised Tim and Steve is we were going to start having success in China, and we were having success with China with a team I hired. Except it wasn't real. Only part of it was real. And I, I remember at the very end, um, I was on a phone. I was in China. I was on the phone with Tim here in the, in the U.S. at the time. And he said, okay, John, what are you going to do? And I explained what he was going to do. And the phone got really quiet. He said, I'm so proud of you. He said, this is going to be really hard, but we'll always be a better company because of that. Now, here's the rest of the story. Remember when the young lady asked about, and I told her to call Brian Liu? Well, it took me most of a year to find a new leader, but I found a great one. And he really believed in our values, even though he'd come from companies that thought about things very differently. And he built an amazing team. And guys, it's now the second largest business that Apple has. And it won't be too many years in the future until it's bigger than the US business. And we would have never gotten there without making that hard choice. But there were a lot of sleepless nights. There was a lot of hang, you know, wringing of hands. I really felt badly for some of those people. Guys, I really felt badly for some employees I had to fire because they did what their bosses told them to do. But at Apple, you have to stand on your own. There's not an excuse just because the boss told you to do it. And so, yeah, that's a, how's that one? That's you just so brought up some really yeah, bad no, memories. That's good. <laughs> if, if I start crying, just tap me on the shoulder. Okay. <laughs> We're done. Okay. So uh, thank you so much for sharing your experience and your wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, John Brandon. Thank you.